Welcome to Conversations in the Spirit of Elizabeth Palmer Peabody and Margaret Fuller Ossley. I am the Reverend Dr. Deborah Pope Lance. I serve as an affiliate minister at the First Parish Unitarian Universalist Church in Wayland, Massachusetts, and work outside the congregation as a consultant with clergy and congregations impacted by clergy misconduct. I am enjoined in these conversations by the Reverend Gail Seavey. Gail, hello. Gail is the minister of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Nashville, Tennessee. These conversations were inspired by two Barry Street essays delivered by each of us at the Ministerial Conference of Barry Street, the longest continuous lecture series in North America, founded in 1820 by the Reverend William Ellery Channing. Gale's 2016 essay, If Our Secrets Define Us, called for an end to secrecy and the necessity of transparency in holding clergy accountable for professional abuses of their power and authority. My 2011 essay, Whence We Come and How and Whither, called attention to my ministerial colleagues' failure to come to consensus about ethical standards in ministry and how this failure has allowed clergy to abuse their power to harm individuals, to threaten our congregation's viability, and to sully our profession. This particular conversation is a part of a series of three that Gail and I are hosting with the three women who are running for the presidency of the Unitarian Universalist Association. The Reverend Jane Jean Pupke, the Reverend Allison Miller, and our guest today, the lead minister of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Phoenix in Paradise Valley, Arizona, the Reverend Susan Frederick Gray. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, it's good to be here. The videos of each candidate's conversation will be put up all at once uh, on my website, deborahpopelance.com without the hyphen, and linked from my Facebook page sometime before June 1st, which is when we expect to have completed all three conversations. Susan, uh, thank you for your willingness to speak with us today about the continuing challenge of responding to clergy misconduct. Um, as you know, Gail and I are using the same five questions as a guide to these conversations with you and all the other candidates. So let's see where our, those five questions take us. Okay. So Susan, um, can you tell us how you first became aware of clergy sexual misconduct? Mm -hmm. So I believe my very first introduction to clergy sexual misconduct was in seminary in an advanced pastoral care and counseling class with mm -hmm. Professor Cheryl Giles when we focused on um, sexual ethics, boundaries, professional boundaries for clergy. And so that was my very first introduction. But I want to lift up that when I really came to know much more about the realities and impact of clergy sexual misconduct was when I did my internship at the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Nashville. And, and I started there in 2001. I was uh, part of that congregation for two years, the first year as a full-time intern minister. The second year I worked for half, for half the year through the end of December as a sabbatical minister when the lead minister, Mary Catherine Warren, was on sabbatical. So, and interestingly, um, or poignantly is probably a better word, it was at that time that I was in Nashville that the Boston Globe was um, doing its reporting mm -hmm. about the Catholic Church and the cover-up and transferring of priests who were abusing children. So it was significant. I mean, na the Nashville congregation was already very open about its history um, and its experience of misconduct. So that was something that was discussed openly. I got to meet and talk with members who were um, victims in the, in the misconduct and meet with them and hear their stories. And it was also interesting to have conversations about clergy misconduct that was being discussed broadly nationally because of the Boston Globe's reporting in the context of the UU Church, the first UU Church of Nashville. 
So what do you, what do you assess as the, the impact of clergy misconduct? Not, it, please do, if you wish, speak about Nashville. But um, as you know, Gail is the minister in Nashville now. Yeah. So uh, uh, what, what do you assess as the impact of clergy misconduct on, on individuals or congregations or the association? I'm particularly interested, um, I never want to forget to lift up the harm done to individuals, but I'm particularly interested in this conversation about what you see as the impact on our congregations and our association. Mm -hmm. So I think that clergy sexual misconduct has, and clergy misconduct of various kinds, has long-term impacts that undermine the health and spiritual vitality of our congregations. But I, th I talk about spiritual vitality as a key piece of my platform and running for UUA president, and I talk about what makes up vitality is um, strong covenant that honors right relationship, clear and transparent practices and processes within an organization, and a clear sense of mission. So clergy misconduct, what I see is one of the impacts, and I believe this is true in our association as well as in our congregations, that it creates and perpetuates systems that are non-transparent, that, um, make it difficult for communities to deal with conflict and challenges openly and um, help with a lot of health in the process. Systems where when there's conflict, it often gets pushed to back rooms to be dealt with quietly. Um, processes that protect secrets, um, processes that protect um, power being used in the system non-transparently and non, not accountably. So I think, you know, even years and years, decades, several decades after misconduct has happened, there can be these processes in an organization that don't allow for clarity, um, that make it hard for a congregation to actually move forward in greater, greater health. Um, part of that is because I think there's two things. One, the misconduct itself undermines trust in leadership. Mm -hmm. So we create, we can create processes that undermine and disempower leadership. But I also suspect, and I would look to Deborah Pope Lance for more conversations about this, that sometimes those processes get put in place um, in a system where um, a leadership doesn't necessarily want there to be strong accountability. And so we disperse power and make confusing systems. Mm -hmm. There are, I actually, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, it just, when I was in New Hampshire on the campaign trail and I was talking about some of our challenges around power and authority and someone gave me this word, disaccountability. Mm -hmm. Oh, I yeah. like that. Yeah, disaccountability. Like that's sort of, that's what we have, a system of disaccountability. And mm -hmm. so, makes it really hard when more challenges arise and the community doesn't know how to deal with them. Um, I've served in Nashville, um, in other congregations where there has been um, professional violations by clergy. And what I've noticed is that when there is conflict, anxiety rises so high um, because of the trauma of going through of what happened in the past, but that anxiety makes it hard to actually move through the conflict in a healthy way. Um, mm -hmm. The system wants to go back to homeostasis and do whatever it can to lower the anxiety rather than actually deal with the hard question that's before it. Um, and it can create systems where people um, really just try to ameliorate things mm -hmm. rather than um, deal with them. And that, all of that, I believe, undermines mission. It keeps us really focused internally. It makes the in internal dynamics of the congregation so difficult and, and requires so much emotional um, mm -hmm. energy that we forget the larger mission of, you know, of trying to nurture people's spiritual lives, make a difference for justice in the larger world, build a community of health and wholeness. So it's, uh, as you say, it, it's the anxiety gets so high that it's hard to make good decisions when what you're really doing, when a congregation's really doing is just servicing its own discomfort. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. It's really, I'm yes. going to, I want to ask a follow-up question, Gail, and then I want to, um, Susan, and then Gail, mm-hmm. I want to ask question four instead of question three. Okay. Let's see. Um, mm. uh, there are folks who would suggest that because um, clergy met misconduct is so widespread, so, so um, fully covered in the media, uh, and because the systems of disaccountability um, have been such of such long standing that we might e- we might even look at the association itself as um, having been impacted ha- and su- such that it's an it's a an organization with misconduct history. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that? What do you think inside? You know, once you're president of this system that has had you know, institutional disaccountability uh, to varying degrees. There has been progress, um, but it still uh, seems to um, miss the mark of where it needs to get to. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I think that that is a helpful assessment. And I have even said on the campaign trail that, so another part of what I talk about is being organized for impact and how our systems are not organized for making change. They're organized often to preserve the status quo and this disaccountability. And some of that comes out of the mistrust at merger. Mm. Um, In terms of an agreement between Unitarians and Universalists and uh, um, about the leadership not taking on the presidency of the Um, combined association and then that not happening right Mm -hmm. so I mean we have this mistrust right at the very beginning of our formation Mm -hmm. as the Unitarian Universalist Association and so that is you know this the mistrust of leadership um, that is deeply ingrained and has continued so Mm -hmm. in coming into this association as president I think what's really important is non-anxious self-differentiated leadership we have systemic challenges in our association. Um, and it's not just about um, clergy sexual misconduct or mm-hmm. professional misconduct. I believe that even the anxiety around how we move forward in a multicultural, mm-hmm. anti oppressive, um, anti racist as a movement, how we move forward in that, those ways has been impacted by. Um, mm-hmm the ways in which anxiety (laughs) rises in our association when we're confronting conflict and and we struggle to make good decisions, we struggle to move forward together um, because the anxiety has such an emotional impact. So I think that self-differentiated, non-anxious leadership that's clear about the mission of the association, clear about who we're called to be, so that we can lift that up in times of challenge to say, okay, let's, oh, let's talk about this and what's going to help us move forward in who we say we are. How do we do that? Mm-hmm. I think that's critical. And there has been improvement and more needs to be made. And mm-hmm. we've got to work on the, the structures that disperse power such that it's really hard for anyone to, to make change or be held accountable um, when the association fails in its responsibility and its care. And, I like the way you connect it to the, uh, the issues of distrust in other, uh, around other issues and at the very um, birth of the association. Uh, you know, I, I like to think about clergy misconduct as a public safety issue, mm-hmm. but it's also evidence of an oppression. Yes. Because yes. often the, the survivors are women, so it's an oppre- oppression by men of women and um, the survivors are laity, um, so it is an oppression uh, of clergy, by clergy of laity. And, and you know, I think using that as a metaphor is dangerous, so I wanna quickly mm-hmm. say, because um, clearly um, it's hard to assess what oppression is worse than another, and it just never should be done. All oppressions are hurt people. Mm-hmm. So, so um, what do you think needs to change or uh, what changes would you make? Um, is it policy? Is it culture? Is it leadership resolve? Is it accountability structures or an end to the norms of secrecy? Um, what do you think has to happen to reduce the incidence of clergy misconduct and 
restore that trust and that confidence um, that's so um, that's that's lagged and really needs to be strong for clergy to lead and for the church to lead for the association to lead. What do you think needs to happen? Yeah. So I think all the things you name are critical. I think education and cultural change, leadership resolve, a commitment to transparency and clear practices and policies are all needed. Mm -hmm. I think another piece that's really important um, for not just the association, but our congregations, is just an acknowledgement that leaders, um, that, that misconduct happens. Mm -hmm. We want to believe that we will somehow be, that our ethics, our values, our faith as Unitarian Universalist protects us um, from the fallibility of humanity. We want to think there's not domestic violence in our congregations. We want to think there's not child abuse in our mm -hmm. congregations. Mm -hmm. And we want to think that our clergy certainly would not misconduct. So one of the most important things that comes first is saying, no, this is going to happen. This is happening. When you start there, then I think you can say, okay, what are the clear practices and policies we need to have in place for when um, a congregation comes to us with a complaint, when we are made aware of mis misconduct, which we know is happening, is gonna happen. I mean, we hope it's not, but it's, I think that's a shift in thinking Mm -hmm. um, that's really critical. And I think as the UUA, we can put out, if we are thinking that way, what are the best practices to share with congregations about policies they should have in place when this happens? Mm -hmm. So that they know what to do. I mean, that's one of the biggest things, I think, is when you realize something is not right in the system in a congregation, it's very hard to know how to deal with it. So if we were addressing this as just like, this is gonna happen, we're human, we're not immune to this. What are the, what should a congregation do when they become aware that their minister is violating professional boundaries? Here's what yeah. you should do. And, you know, we're going to team to develop those strategies, but be proactive, be prepared. And, and also to prevent it. Um, some of the strategies you talked about, um, talking about just basic policies and procedures around accountability. Yeah. Um, I would, my experience is help congregations prevent it as well. Yes. So uh, you're talking about doing the EUA, but I, I, you know, I think that's important as you're moving it to the congregations. That's a support that they could use. We, we've had people try to, to teach people how, what to do if after it happens, yeah. but not, not, broadly enough, but I, I've, I haven't seen any um, uh, thing from the UA to help congregations understand um, it as a, a basic health accountability issue, um, as you've talked about, and you can see that that was very helpful as well. Yeah, and I think the more accountability and processes and named mm -hmm. policies we have in place, that is an inhibitor. Yeah. And when there is misconduct, when there's a clear path and a and clear accountability, that helps it not spread, right? I mean, it already prevents, um, we would hope, um, colleagues, leaders from doing it again somewhere else. One of the right? challenges, at, I'm sorry. No, um, go ahead. One of the challenges at the association level <clears throat> is that the systems in place have been understood to be responsive and not proactive. Um, you know, there's the bylaws about the MFC, there are the policies about the MFC, the procedures, and then there are rules. And actually, in their charter, they have the authority to um, proactively respond to misconduct because if they if they become aware from any identifiable source that misconduct is happening, they can act. But that has, um, for the whole life of the association, been understood to mean they have to get a written complaint from a first party person. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes the first party person is the last person to know that misconduct can happen and it happened to her. Mm -hmm. So 
um, I, I'm glad to hear you talking about needing to be uh, hold people more accountable. I, I think it needs to be proactive at the association level uh, in ways it has not been. Because what happens is congregations just basically devolve into conflict. Those who believe misconduct can happen and those who believe not, not in our church. So, um, yeah, I think the association has a uh, significant role to play as we go forward from the place we are now and continue to try to change whatever needs to be changed so that there's uh, less clergy misconduct and more accountability and a building of trust. Yeah. I think you've really covered so much of um, what we wanted to ask you, but I wondered if uh, your experiences as a um, justice leader um, in the immigration community, which is both inside and outside our walls, but is often focused in the greater community, if anything of that has affected how you think about how we deal with clergy misconduct. Yeah, it has. It was um, so one of the things I've been privileged to the people I've been privileged to work with um, in the immigration work in Arizona have been movement lawyers. <laughs> right. These are attorneys that are committed to building greater justice and systems of accountability. And so, you know, I we just completed a federal lawsuit against Sheriff Joe Arpaio in the state of Arizona around workplace raids. But even in my arrest in 2010, um, shutting down Sheriff Arpaio's jail, we had a whole network of lawyers who were there to defend us and to help us move our message um, through the court, right? To continue to get the message across about um, justice for immigrants about the brutality and the unconstitutionality of the of sheriff arpaio's department and policing tactics so it leads me to think about um because i am aware that it that lawyers <laughs> um get involved in the protection you know whenever there's accusations of misconduct different things um people look to lawyers to protect themselves and the institution um, and certainly though that is needed sometimes. Um, but what's interesting about movement lawyers, and it's led me to think about how, you know, there, what would it mean to work with mm -hmm. lawyers who have represented victims and to say, how could a faith community um, advocate to really be committed to transparency in response to clergy misconduct? Mm -hmm. Help us think about how we can create policies that do this, or if we're going to, or if there's a case against the association, to find the kind of lawyer who's going to say, I'm going to advocate, because if we win on this, it's a win for um, victims everywhere. It's a win for um, helping religious communities be uh, more accountable, more effective in addressing misconduct. So it's a, it's a kind of legal framework, movement lawyers, that's not about minimizing risk. And again, there are times when you need that kind of advice, but it's, it's lawyers who want to say, how can we help through a legal process, an institution committed to justice, be more effective in building justice in the wider culture. So that's one huge thing that I feel like is, could, be, could be really helpful in this time. Yeah. So that's what a concept. What a concept, yeah. a justice-making lawyer. Yeah, they are. I, I've worked with them. They're phenomenal. Instead of a risk-reducing lawyer. Yeah. Right. Because, uh, right. you know, every time someone's threatened a suit uh, that I know of, and of course I don't know all because it's not always public or even um, known by anyone, but uh, the lawyers have, have always wanted to curtail a suit actually happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've said, you know, bring it on, you know, yeah. make him prove because the burden's going to be on the person who brings the suit to prove that right. what he or she alleges is true. And uh, that's what we need to know. You can't have justice unless you have truth. Right. So what a concept, Susan. Yeah. And, and movement lawyers want to go to court because they want the, you know, they want to push the issue. 
They want the press. They want the conversation. They want to bring awareness. And they want to forward the law. And they want to forward the law. They want to forward justice. They, you know, they're so You know, we've spoken, spoken many times with victims. Um, so most of them don't want to think about suing anyone because they um, love Unitarian Universalism, even though many of them leave it. Right. And, um, or it's re-traumatizing or, you know, numbers of reasons. Right. And um, it would be such a model for, and healing, I believe, for victims to see that happen um, in court once, just once. What, it, it would just change a lot. Yeah. So uh, one one last question. Um, so how do you see this issue, uh, clergy misconduct, relating to the other issues that have been important to you and that you've forwarded in your campaign? Mm -hmm. Well, so I do talk a lot about power mm -hmm. on the campaign trail. I do offer a power analysis of the UUA, which we've already really talked about. But I want to lift up that at the UUMA ministers meeting, the Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association gathering last GA 2016, we, the three candidates, were asked what did we think were the three main areas of competency that clergy really needed to have in this time. Um, and I said three things. One of them was about multiculturalism and how to help grow uh, congregations, uh, multicultural congregations. Number two, I said we had to understand money better. And number three, I said we need a deeper understanding of power. Yeah. Because the misuse of power so deeply affects our congregations and our association that we really have to understand that. We have to understand our own power and how to use it ethically, transparently, how to share it in order to help more people and leaders have power, how to be collaborative in how we lead. And I even named that I think there's, it, it's interesting. Um, because we, I suspect that so many of us, clergy, lay people, we all have experiences of abuse of power. That one of, so there's abuse of power. There's also people abdicating their own power and not realizing the power that they hold. And that I believe also can lead to poor boundaries um, that can, uh, undermine a congregation's capacity to grow in health um, and can lead to misconduct, a failure to recognize your own power. So that was actually what I lifted up right at the beginning, that we yeah. need to be better, we need to understand power better so we can use it ethically, transparently, and be a model. I mean, we live in a culture, um, we talk about white supremacy and in, in Arizona with indigenous leaders and indigenous leaders I've worked with and members of our congregation who are indigenous, they call it colonialism, but we live in a militarized system of domination and oppression. And we are a faith community that says we are committed to beloved community and to humanity, common humanity. So how can we model power that actually, um, helps us grow in our humanity, not diminish one another or, 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 um, or hurt one another. Break trust. So, so power. That's my <laughs> So Susan, how would you do that? How would you begin to um, have a deepen the understanding people have, you use have of power mm -hmm. um, or to model somehow the deepening of an understanding of power? Mm -hmm. well, I think we can do it. Yeah, I mean, I think some of it comes through education. Power is not something we're really comfortable talking about. How are we clear about this is the power that you hold as a minister? Um, this, you know, this is tremendous power. Even when you feel like the congregation's not listening and all these things, like you hold this power in your role mm -hmm. um, as a leader. So what are the responsibilities around that? And how, um, how to wield it. Yeah, uh, in the ethically. service of and yeah. right ministry. ethically and in the service of ministry and mission, um, open conversations about that. And yeah. it, you know, ministry is hard, and so I, I do, you know, I, I do worry that we and because of the anti-authority, you know, the challenges with authority in our movement, 
that are both protect secrets and protect, preserve the status quo as well as our result of misconduct, all of those things at the same time. Um, we, we, any of us as ministers can fail to see the real power that we hold. So education is important. And case studies, I mean, different ways to, different ways to educate colleagues around it. Yeah. Well, um, this has been great, Susan. Do, yeah. uh, is there anything that, you know, you might want to add that we didn't give you a chance to otherwise uh, say that's important? Uh, I think I said, yeah, I just, I, I thank you, Deborah and Gail, for your work and your leadership. And um, if I'm elected president, I look forward to working with you and being in further conversation um, because we've got, you know, I really do feel it. Gail's address and your address op are opening up real change, as well as the conversation we're having about uh, counter oppression, um, mm -hmm. white supremacy. Like we're opening up something here, and I, I hope the anxiety doesn't <laughs> prevent us from moving forward and making making some deep change to live into the the faith that I think our theology calls us to. Thank you, Susan. Um, thanks for yeah. joining us on uh, for a conversation in the spirit of. Liz Peabody and Peg Fuller. Yeah, you're um, welcome. We're grateful to have a chance to hear your thoughts on um, this really important subject. Um, and thanks, Gail, for being in conversation again. Thank you, Deb. And uh, may these conversations continue to serve to bring uh, ethical, ethical clarity to the practice of ministry and mm -hmm. greater transparency to efforts to hold clergy accountable to the highest standards of practice. Mm -hmm. Susan, we wish you well and your fellow candidates uh, all the best and eagerly await the results of the election in June. What day is it in June, Susan? June 24th at 5 I knew, I knew you would know. That's, that's a month from yesterday. I knew you would know. <laughs> exactly. I, exactly. You know, thanks uh, for everyone who's viewed this to here. Thank you for joining us and uh, join us again. And, uh, and, uh, Goodbye. Goodbye. Blessings. Goodbye. Bye. Yeah.